Good afternoon. It's uh, Tuesday, uh, sorry, Thursday, the 11th of May, 2017, just after one o'clock. Apologies for the slight technical glitch there. Uh, welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson, and joining me today is Alex Thompson. Uh, welcome to the programme, Alex. Thank you, Mike. Good to be back. And uh, I feel that as we approach the electoral cycle, we're uh, getting into top gear with UK column coverage and other viewers have been telling me the same. Well, that's good to hear. Well, let's get straight on into it then. And of course, uh, the big news from yesterday was the meeting of uh, Donald Trump and Sergei Lavrov. Uh, and also, uh, of course, Lavrov mainly spending his time with Rex Tillerson. Um, so as a result of that meeting, it's been announced that uh, Trump will meet President Putin in July as part of the G20 summit in Hamburg. Uh, and uh, well, uh, Lavrov's comments have been generally positive, Alex. It sounds like uh, they consider that uh, they can do business with uh, with these uh, two Americans that uh, perhaps only a few weeks ago might have seemed unlikely. It does rather imply that uh, Tillerson and Trump behind him have uh, swung round to a more establishment or deep state position than they, they were billed as, doesn't it, Sir Mike? People had their suspicions when the, the Exxon man Tillerson was appointed Secretary of State. And then some, including a viewer of ours in Russia, who's very well informed, said, well, you just see, he knows how to get a deal. He's, uh, he's very experienced in his chain of command in business, which, of course, is the kind of man that Trump likes. This may be so, but uh, as Lavrov has rather delicately pointed out today, this is a man without ideology who will do whatever it takes to cut the deal. And I haven't looked up the original Russian, but if Lavrov said that he was uh, glad to be talking to business mieni, the, the English loan word in Russian for businessmen, that actually has a slight tint to it. It, it uh, almost implies I'm dealing with wheeler dealers, you know, men who uh, who will do anything to get their business done. So I, I think uh, he's, he's hinting here that he knows something about the moral stance or lack thereof of the administration. Um, well, one of the things that Lavrov uh, said was that uh, that they agreed to continue to work together within the Astana format. Uh, and that's, uh, that seems like a bit of a shift uh, in US policy, um, certainly from some of the following the bombing of, of, a, of an airbase anyway. Um, so uh, you wanted to cover uh, uh, 21st Century Wire's coverage of this, the Astana process, a possible solution to an impossible situation in Syria. Yes, do read this article in full. It's a, it's a uh, quite a doughty read, actually. That's uh, that's my printout of it, double sided. But I'll just uh, go through the headers for you, in which um, good old Patrick Hennison has, has uh, accurately summarised uh, how much of a tectonic shift this Astana deal is. For, I mean, starting from the fact that it was done on the Central Asian steppe in the new purpose-built capital of Kazakhstan. I mean, that's as Eurasian as you get. You know, the the, the, the geographical centre of the geographical centre of Asia in a city which was desert until a few years ago, plays host to uh, the leading powers of Asia since time immemorial, uh, Russia, Turkey, Persia and the Arab world coming together. But here's the headlines uh, of his piece. He's got Moscow sets the pace and agenda, Eastern centre of gravity. When I tweeted out the Astana news, I said that this was the first 21st century peace accord where Europe was completely irrelevant when it wasn't being mal actively malicious sabotaging ceasefires, that means NATO, of course, and the US, redefining the language of the conflict, which is what the uh, the Asian powers have done now that they've basically broken loose from, from the UK-US deep state. And uh, Western miracles, that's obviously a, a cynical headline. Israeli ambitions, then we get into Golan and, and water and oil issues. Partitioning Syria, which is the US plan and the Israeli plan, and the irony of the so-called rebel walkout at Astana. Um, this is a, a well-known technique in peace talks, of course. You invite the so-called moderate opposition and wait for them to walk off in a huff to point out that they were never prepared to do a deal, also been done in Cyprus. And then finally, he has a section called Divine Intervention, Homegrown Terror or Chemical Weapons Intelligence, in inverted commas. And then more about uh, reconciliation, because Syria is utterly wrecked morally, uh, physically, and people have got huge amounts of trauma to recover from in their families and in their neighbourhoods. Can they ever trust their neighbours again in places where the, the, the Sunnis were persuaded to betray the non-Sunnis by the new wave of takfirism coming out of the Gulf? So in all of these, Asia's taking the lead. And Europe is just irrelevant at best. Uh, you know, it used to be said, and in, in, in our news coverage it is still so, that nothing interesting happens east of Vienna. Uh, well, our news programmes are still pretending that's the case, and that's why they're bereft of content, because the diplomacy now is going on exclusively east of Vienna, and the West is all noise. Um, absolutely. Uh, now, we have a little bit of a of video here. Tell us, tell us what this is. 
this is obviously Russian government TV, Russia Adin, um, but uh, just look at the body language here. Erdogan comes and meets Putin in Astana, and look at the subtitles if you're re watching it. Uh, Putin couldn't get his uh, bum parked on a seat, and he's making gestures because there's, there's loads of Turkish hangers-on trying to obstruct, obstruct the process. And here Putin at this point is, is pointing the finger and saying, what's, what's up with your flunkies? They're stopping us from starting the meeting. So uh, you can see, obviously, there's some theatre in it. The Russians and especially Putin are very good at this calm, controlled, composed uh, setup for the cameras. But clearly, the Turks were thinking this is grandiose because this is the Turkic world of which Kazakhstan is a member, playing host to the not just being the geographic centre of the world anymore, but being the diplomatic centre of the world. Conveniently forgetting, of course, that the Anglo-Americans and the Germans have been using them as as um, basically as stooges for a very long time. So it's a uh, a complicated situation, but basically Putin had to call Erdogan to order in order to force this deal through. Erdogan, of course, enjoyed being treated as an equal with the Russians and Iranians, which he isn't intellectually or, or in material terms. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it is the case, of course, that the United States is only an observer at the uh, Astana talks at this point in time. Um, yes. So uh, now, of course, the, the uh, I should say the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense was giving a briefing on the Astana Accords. Uh, and particularly on the de-escalation areas, zones, whatever you want to call them. Um, so uh, what were they saying? Well, they were outlining off the top of their heads. Yes, they had notes in front of them, but the, these three Russian MOD officers were very competently. Uh, I was particularly impressed by the one on the right in our picture, Mr. Gadji Mohamedov, who just uh, answered off the top of his head uh, all the time. Uh, they're, they're answering on these zones. They're up to speed on what ethnic groups li uh, are where, what rebel groups are where. I don't think any... Um, should we say staff military officers in the West, certainly in front of cameras, could perform like that. And just look, and if you can find the video, uh, there's always two channels worth watching, Inessa S and Russia Insider, which produce gobbits of main Russian diplomatic news uh, with subtitles, with a day or two's time delay for subtitling. If you look at those, those you will see uh, not just the body language, uh, but also the fact that they have this massive briefing screen, which was, I think, installed last year. And when the M Russian MOD does briefings, it really does them in style with these widescreen briefings pointing out exactly what's happening on the ground. They're, they're streets ahead of the Pentagon or the, or the uh, British MOD in their presentation, really, uh, optically and, and uh, in terms of, of being a, in a mastery of the detail. And there was a small coterie of mostly East Asian press corps asking questions in good Russian at the end. And again, well behaved. You know, they actually said, General so-and-so, I have a question to ask. And they asked the question in 30 seconds without rhetoric and then finished by saying thank you and sitting down. And then the question actually gets answered in one sentence. I mean, it's just uh, really showing up the, the, the charade of, of uh, Western pretense to be leading the world at the moment. Um, it's, it's even worse than that, Alex, I think, because uh, in the, in the uh, CNN coverage of the fact that uh, Trump and uh, uh, Putin are to meet at the G20, um, they, the Western media has, uh, mainstream media has got into this habit now of placing a headline. So the headline was quite a positive headline saying, and this was CNN uh, in this case, saying that uh, Trump and uh, Putin were to meet at the G20. And then immediate be immediately below that was a video clip, um, which was not actually relevant to the story, um, uh, to the main body of the story. And the video clip was from a couple of weeks ago, basically saying uh, with the headline that Putin saying that uh, relations between uh, Russia and the United States at their lowest ever level. And I'm seeing this, in, this, this has got to be a psychological trick, is it not? This, this is, they, they, place a headline because they have to admit the fact that Putin and Trump are going to meet at the G20, but they don't really like that situation. So they place a video clip below it, uh, which is from a completely different news story. Um, and that messes with people's minds, does it not? Oh, yes. It, it, what it does from the press point of view is it covers the, the backsides of the main players so that they claim, yes, we, we gave full uh, accountability of what we uh, were claiming and, and look below the headline, look at the content and you'll see what we were getting at. But of course, they know perfectly well that the floating voter type, uh, most, most people are not uh, highly engaged on foreign affairs, of course, even intelligent people don't see it as relevant to them and their lives mostly. Uh, so that the, that the press know that they can get away with this for that crucial middle ground of opinion that uh, that's, you know bends with the wind, I think. It's also a kind of click by clickbaitization of Western media that you know you see the headline coming along on social media and share it. Precisely what we in the independent media are now being accused of, of course, you know that the misleading headlines being shared on social media without the, the content being read. Uh, David Scott, for example, on Twitter always challenges people who come back at him. Have you read what I tweeted? 
and most often they give him abuse because they haven't. So, but that's that's going on right the way up to CNN and BBC, where our own dear David Ellis is told that he's a, a loon and, a, and an income poop and a troublemaker and told <laughs> to shut up because he talks to BBC journalists. Yes. Um, yeah. OK, well, look, um, yesterday we mentioned uh, Indonesia and the fact that the White Helmets appear to be moving into that country and we're really asking, where's the need? Uh, there seems to be some kind of destabilization going on there, uh, process going on there. Um, but we highlighted this um, this document or these two documents, which you were very kind enough to uh, translate for us, um, which seems to be showing uh, direct links between the uh, Golden Future Foundation, the foundation is behind the White Helmets movement in uh, Indonesia uh, and links back to Syria. Now, I was just interested in your thoughts in this whole in the, this whole scenario because uh, Vanessa Bailey uh, has been talking about uh, the fact that um, the White Helmets are very likely to be that the, the the structure and the and the sort of PR machine to be exported to other countries around the world. Indonesia seems to be the first. But uh, what are your thoughts on this, Alex? In a way, Mike, I think this is an extension of the point I was just making about the increasing irrelevance of the West. Um, Western money is necessary. If you're going to run scams and military uh, nastiness through NGO cover, you at least need people to be giving to the charities. And if the Western donors or even taxpayer base is dwindling to the point where the money's not there, you're going to have to start engaging the Islamic world to do so, or the uh, not just a, a religious issue, but should we say the the uh, the emerging markets, the second world countries like Turkey and Indonesia, which are getting as prosperous as us now because they still have industry, and that's what's happened here. When I translated it, I noticed that the Golden sorry, Future Foundation is based in Bandung, an old uh, Dutch colony on Java, and there's there's hundreds of cities like this in the emerging Muslim world now that have got middle class Muslims many of whom are quite pious about their religion. They've got a conscience. And so the, in the background material you sent me, I saw that the idea is to point people to the, the verses in the Quran about charity and the, the duty to one's neighbor. Uh, and the idea is, OK, you've got this new, newly rediscovered conscience. Your uh, The society is becoming more religious. The world is becoming more religious than it was in the late 20th century. Um, let's channel this towards uh, the first evident way to do good much like Christian charity givers have been diddled for a century, certainly half a century, by similar charities. Um, you know, I could name names, but uh, uh, I won't. But you know, major Chris, so-called Christian charities doing um, the, the deep state's bidding. That's what's being now done, is that, is that the, the, the Muslim middle class is being hijacked uh, to give. And as for Indonesia itself, yes, I've been following that 20 years or more, uh, 25, because uh, there's been a series of localised civil wars. Some of the islands where the Dutch colonised became majority Protestant or majority Catholic. So although it's the world's most populous Muslim nation uh, and has perhaps the world's biggest discretionary spending in, for, of its Muslim population, so very attractive to fake NGOs, uh, it's also a place where you can easily stoke uh, a round of ethnic tension culminating in civil war. On islands like Ambon, that's happened repeatedly. Excellent excuse for the British, Australian and American navies to uh, roll in. We've seen the first sea lord been, talk been talking about this openly for a year now, the fist in the in the velvet glove of humanitarian action. And there's an existing five power agreement between Britain, Australia, New Zealand to guarantee Malaysia and Singapore because of the Straits of Malacca. So it's, it's a way, as you suggested, Mike, of yesterday of getting a civil war in action um, descending on Indonesia with all the military force the West has got, I think, and then uh, you've got a humanitarian crisis, and then you can do the Syrian model again. Yeah. So, um, Indonesia has, or part of it, has been destroyed. It needs rebuilding. Uh, send in the white helmets. Look at them bravely. Uh, at, you know, to the last man, they're all handsome and all holding children in their arms who, who are wailing uh, appropriately to camera. You know, that, that that's the the kind of model that's going to be exploited. I think we need to be ahead of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, look, let's move on to Mas uh, Macedonia then. Um, tell us about this. This was one of the Russian tweeters who found out what the US was doing. If you look at the red box at the bottom, you may have to freeze the screen to do so. The date is, if I remember correctly, September 2013. That's just before the events of Crimea. And here is, uh, they've got their hands on a US Navy procurement order stating that the US Navy is going to be rebuilding the Naval College at Sevastopol, which is, you know, absolutely sacred ground to the Russian Navy. It's the training college for the cadets right next to Russia's only warm water port, apart from Vladivostok, which is no use because it, uh, it gives on to the Pacific of course. So uh, this, this is really uh, within a whisker that the US or the deep state within the US got of completely uh, reframing and denying to the Russians uh, for, for, for good, really, the use of their, of their naval facilities, their absolutely crucial naval facilities for which they went to, to war surreptitiously in 2014. 
Um, okay, so that was in fact Ukraine. So let's now talk about Macedonia. So Macedonians enraged at socialist oppo leader Zaev uh, for approving an Albanian uh, as uh, par as parliamentary speaker. Um, Macedonia is what's this a color revolution on its way here? Yeah, it's, it's already been color revolution several times. It's crucial to both the EU and NATO, and particularly the Anglo-American deep state half of NATO has been pushing, like it did with Georgia and Ukraine 10 years ago now, to get uh, formal EU me NATO membership. And Trump's now cleared, um, the, I think he sent it to the US Senate for ratification, of Macedonia's application for NATO membership. But there's, a, there's basically an, an undeclared civil war going on in Macedonia. And uh, the Russians are now openly calling it um, the CIA or American project to create a greater Albania. A large majority of the population in, in, in Macedonia is Albanian. And they got to the point where the ethnic Albanian party, it's quite worrying that there is such a thing and that they don't vote with the mainstream parties. But anyway, the ethnic Albanians broke from, should we say, the patriotic party, which has uh, stood up to the Turks for 100 years and uh, decided to go with the social democrats. And uh, they could put up, um, I think his name is uh, Jalat Taferi, yes, is the, is the um, Albanian whom they put up in an unlawful process uh, to in parliament because the, the figurehead president had not actually given his approval for this government to come together. He'd said, you threaten the future of the country by your policies, such as the use of the Albanian language. So they were basically meeting in illegal session in parliament, pretended that they had a divine right of parliament. This happens quite a lot now, actually, even Dutch MPs are pretending that they have the right to act without the crown. And they, they met in this session and then they, the, the, the shot I showed you of, of people letting off fireworks and storming parliament is uh, happened on the 27th of April. They just had enough. They went in and not only did they uh, attack the man who was bloodied in that bottom inset photo, which is the leader of the Social Democrat Party who doesn't have a seat in parliament. They also took the parliamentary leader of the opposition and dragged her by her hair. She's not in that shot. Mrs. Radmila Shekerinska and dragged her by her hair and she needed stitches afterwards. Now, I can't excuse that. But if I read you even some of the Wikipedia article about her, you'll see what's been going on. She was the Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration of Macedonia and National Coordinator for Foreign Assistance. Then she went off to do a master's degree at Tufts, one of the uh, the, the leading neocons favoured universities for Eastern European stooges. Um, and when she came back from Massachusetts, she became involved in the Open Society Institute of George Soros, got a seat on Skopje City Council, the capital city where about a third of the population lives, um, and got, got a seat in Parliament and uh, ended up as acting prime minister. Uh, so you can see what's happening, really. Soros, is, as I mentioned re briefly last time, he's actually been uh, paying with US aid and US State Department money uh, for Macedonian to receive a translation of the original book for Marxist revolutionaries, Rules for Radicals, written by Alinsky and dedicated to Lucifer. Macedonia, of course, is being hammered because it's uh, it's the way through which, the route through which the, uh, the, the refugees whom Turkey lets loose will be flooded up into Europe, although Viktor Orban of Hungary is trying to stop them now with a double fence. Um, well, let's just look at a, a little bit of that because uh, perhaps a little surprised to see the Hill covering this, but why is the State Department refusing to disclose Soros' involvement in Macedonia? That's a very good question. It certainly is. And the Hill, I mean, for those who are not aware, the Hill is, is American political colloquialism for Capitol Hill. So it's basically talking about the affairs of Congress, the parliamentary affairs of America. Um, you'd never expect such a mainstream political title uh, to, to get involved. But I think there's been so much social media campaigning by independent people, awareness raising um, of George Soros and the evil he represents, that it's now a talking point. I mean, it's to the extent now where so people know who Soros is, at least they don't know his details, they know the name. And even the less reputable independent sites, uh, although it may not be sourced, they're, they're at least a, a, a claiming that President Duterte of the Philippines, for example, is saying to Soros, if you ever come to my country, you're a dead man, which could well have happened behind the scenes. They don't have a source for it, but I don't think they would. Uh, I think it was your Newswire who printed that. Um, but it, even if it wasn't said, it's the kind of apocryphal story that's being made up because anyone who's not in the, the West's pocket at the moment is thinking that about Soros. And I think the American public is starting to wonder uh, what Soros is going to do to us. I mean, we've been saying for 15 years in channels like this that when Soros is done with the poultry countries of Eastern Europe, he's going to colour revolutionise Britain and America. And I think he's already started in Scotland. I think he's, well, I think he's been trying in America as well. But he, uh, this is the video uh, of Orban uh, speaking to the EU about Soros NGOs. 
Yes, and as I said uh, there with the, uh, the the screen capture I've got here, uh, Orban was telling the European Parliament, who weren't booing and jeering this time, actually, I think he's making progress in persuading the middle ground. He was telling the MPs that uh, you're, you're fools, he used parliamentary language, but he basically said you are fools to think that Soros is your champion, um, because the, the idea is nasty Orban is shutting down Soros's central European university. Um, and this is a great assault on on uh, freedom of the of academe and so on. But he was saying in the chamber, you, you, you're stupid because uh, this Soros is a speculator who's going to bring down Euro like he tried to bring down Sterling in Black Wednesday in 1992. So Orban is, is really giving uh, no quarter in his battle. And I thought the body language was interesting in this debate that no longer a solid block of so-called liberals and social democrats jeering at him. They're listening politely to him. And he's even getting applause now because the um, EFDD grouping, so UKIP and its continental allies, is, is sizable now. Uh, so he's actually got support in the chamber. Yeah. OK. Well, look, uh, Alex, let's move on to uh, the election um, and uh, the unaccompanied children from Syria uh, issue is now an election issue. Um, this is uh, fantastic. Tim Farron has made it an election issue. Now, of course, we've got to remember Tim Farron's uh, uh, form on this, because in 2014, when he was president of the Liberal Democrat Party, Tim Farron said that uh, the Liberal Democrats must answer serious questions over who knew what about allegations of sexual abuse against the MP, the former MP, Cyril Smith. Uh, of course, since then, we've had complete silence. Uh, from the Liberal Democrat Party and complete silence from Tim Farron uh, as he's been leader. Um, but he has now decided that uh, Britain should be bringing 50,000 unaccompanied children from Syria to the UK. He's made this statement today as part of his electioneering. Um, and so it's now an election issue. This gives people that might think that this is, uh, that the uh, Tim Farron and the Liberal Democrats have got some questions to answer here, gives them a perfect opportunity to ask those questions. Um, so uh, here's what he said. I don't want us, Britain, to be the kind of country who turns our backs on those in desperate need. This is about Britain doing its fair share. Now, let's just remember that it is over a year ago since I published a challenge to Tim Farron on this issue. Um, and to date, he has made no uh, statement about what he is going to do about the, the Syrian children, unaccompanied children coming, coming to this children and disappearing out the other side of the care system. Uh, and uh, he has acknowledged in emails that we have uh, that uh, it's these children are quite possibly being trafficked and used for sexual exploitation. So um, let's just remember that uh, not so long ago, uh, this report came out uh, heading back to harm. The, the, to quote from the report, it said, trafficked and unaccompanied asylum seeking children are going missing from UK care at an alarmingly high rate. And let's not forget that in 2012, the all-party parliamentary group for runaway and missing children and adults uh, and the all-party uh, all party parliamentary group for looked after children and care leavers uh, produced this report uh, from the joint inquiry. Fo uh, this was following this inquiry into missing children. It was co-chaired by Anne Coffey MP uh, and uh, by... Uh, uh, and so the first paragraph of this um, art, uh, this report says it all really. It says there's a scandal going on in England involving children missing from care and until recent cases of child sexual exploitation in Rochdale and other places put the spotlight on this issue, it was going on pretty much unnoticed. The report says it's 68,000 children in care in the UK. It says that local authorities with responsibility for children are required to report on whether they have run away for more than 24 hours to the Department of Education once a year. The data for 2011 showed at that time that 930 individual children went missing uh, using this measure of going missing for over 24 hours. The report says police figures suggest 17,000 incidents and 5,000 individual children going missing from care every year. That's 17,000 incidents and 5,000 individual children going from missing from care every year. This is British children from the British care system. This is before unaccompanied children that are a lot less easily tracked uh, even started coming to this country. So um, the situation is in fact much worse today. Now the question then is how many of these children return? How many of them end up being trafficked? The report says there are also major problems with quanti uh, sorry, the quality of data collected on trafficked children. Uh, the numbers reported by CEOP uh, approximately 300 between 20, 2007 and 2010 
is widely thought to be the very tip of the iceberg, and the lack of robust and comprehensive data was also identified by, by the inquiry as a key obstacle to ke keeping children safe. Now, we have uh, done a lot of work over the last two, three years on the issue of the data that's being kept on children that are going missing from care, uh, and the situation has not improved since 2012. Uh, there still is not good data on this. Uh, and, you know, we pointed out last year that the Independent and other newspapers had reported uh, within a six month period, at least 300 uh, unaccompanied children going missing out of the care system. And to date, Tim Farron does not want to deal with this issue. Uh, as I've said, there are emails have gone backwards and forwards between us and Mr. Farron. Uh, this is one from Linda Lauderdale. Uh, and others have been sending emails to him. He refuses to engage. In this particular example, he said that he disagrees with the contention that the issues that have been, that have been raised are more important than his local constituency issues. Uh, for example, he said he thinks that the two and a half thousand local families affected by flooding would disagree that their plight isn't important. Nobody's suggesting for one second that the plight of people suffering from flooding is not important. The issue is, Mr. Farron, will you engage on this issue? And to date, you absolutely refuse to do so. Um, so this was my paraphrasing of his attitude, uh, that if he does something about it, his parliamentary colleagues of all parties would have nothing to play with. Now, Alex, that might seem like a pretty harsh statement, but I cannot get to grips with the fact that somebody is calling for children who are in a desperate situation already to come to this country where they're quite likely to find themselves in an equally desperate situation, if not worse. Uh, he's not willing to guarantee the safety of the children that he's demanding to bring into this country. What, what do we do with politicians like this? We replace them with men who allow, allow themselves to be ruled by their understanding and intellect and who actually take orders from the electorate. As I was saying at Winchester at the British Constitution Group talk, uh, MPs take our orders. They are public servants. The problem with the social justice warrior thinking, which has particularly infected the left of centre, um, social democrat, liberal democrat mentality in the West, is the idea of virtue signalling. You put the Tim Farron quotation up there. I don't want the kind of country where, Mr Farron, you don't go into politics to establish your will. You go there to do what you're appointed by the electorate to do. And the, the people of Britain have not expressed a clear desire to import lots of Syrian children, particularly not unaccompanied ones, uh, and particularly where the state has already failed. And anyone who's engaged and energised on the issue knows that. And we've, we're even getting people of similar political bent to Tim Farron, independents and, and Guardian type journalists pointing this out. Do we have a right? Are we, in a, uh, are we sensible to take on more children uh, when those of, uh, of the similar kind who've already been taken in have gone missing at such a rate? And the other side of uh, I think defending your conclusion there, Mike, about uh, Mr. Farron's colleagues having nothing to play with is this, that um, uh, Tim Farron is uh, perhaps somewhat naive, like most people who've not come up close with pederasty and the market in it, into what it means for children to be abused. We have an opinion, we have an idea. As with rape, we have the idea of people being snatched off the street. Uh, yes, it happens, but it's not the, not the only or most common form of rape. So with child abuse, I'm afraid, there are cases of children being taken and kept in a dungeon until they die, sadly. But much more common is children being borrowed, used and returned. This is what the whole Pizzagate, Pedogate issue uh, with many videos uh, full of photos is coming out uh, about on, on YouTube now, is that you see facilities where children, and it's now more out in the open, but it's been going on a long time, where the elite take children to dingy rooms with nasty mattresses and use them and then put them back. And our interview with John Wedger made this point quite clearly. Well, well, in that fact, Alex, that's, were, that's, that sorry, in. Alex, that's exactly right, isn't it? Because perhaps where the all-party all parliamentary group report on this issue falls down is, uh, of course, they, they are particularly focusing on, uh, on children that, that aren't returning. But in fact, if children have been out for 24 hours from care, what have they been doing in that period? And I think you've just given a hint. That's it. And we have had testimonies at UK Column and BCG 
from those who were victimised, particularly those within the easy drive, easy-ish drive of London, like the Nottingham cluster, which was a particularly corrupt one going back right back to the 80s. They were taken out in a minibus for the weekend. Those in the London outer boroughs, which was John Wedge's specialism in tracking down, although he got too good at it and was sacked for it, um, that was even more convenient for the elite because they could be taken out of their borough of Croydon or Haringey or whatever on a Thursday night, abused overnight or if necessary on a two day bender and then put back on the Sunday morning. And the staff whom John Wedger went and interviewed about this said, oh, yes, well, the charities have told us we don't report on this. Or the police liaison people, all common purpose, well, many of them common purpose, have said, don't bother reporting them if they're just going out. Just to, you have to assume that they're high on drugs and, you know, that the connections were not being made. Or again, with Mr. Farron, the will is not there to go beyond your personal gut feelings uh, and, you know, uh, not, not to do a politics of feeling, but actually to analyse this and to realise what's going on is a perfect system of borrowing and returning the children chewing them up and spitting them out, letting them recover a bit, and then having access to them the following weekend. You know, that, so that those those are not being reported as missing. And some of the documents that uh, we've been highlighting about this show that common purpose op operatives like Cressida Dick now at the top of the Met Police uh, were present at meetings where this very strategy was discussed, although they're careful, careful to keep their names out of the minutes, I think. But they were there when it, the strategy was discussed. How do we define missing persons to avoid frightening the horses? And the, the definition of the public is, 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 it is hope that the public will go by, is the one that would form in, in your idea, in your mind, if you hadn't thought about it, which is children snatched and never seen again. Well, that's a small minority of the problem. Yeah. Um, so just to end this section then, uh, this has now become an election issue because thankfully Tim Farron has decided that it is going to be one. Um, so this gives people an opportunity. But one of the issues that we see, uh, if we look at comments on uh, YouTube and so on, uh, people are so disengaged with politics, so disillusioned with politics, uh, that they, they don't see the point in uh, going and challenging MPs or prospective MPs on issues. They don't see the point in voting, fair enough. But, but even to go and try to hold these people to account is something that, that people are unwilling to do. Um, what do we need to do to encourage people to, to take the information that's being presented here and actually go and stick it in Tim Farron's face? It's difficult. And I think those of us like me who are committed Christians have a particular role to play uh, because we can, even if we can't persuade the, the Christian politicians themselves that they're being naive and willfully blind, we can at least talk to their congregations and their ministers. And that there are similar equivalents for those who are not churchgoers, such as uh, clubs that they attend. Uh, moral pressure and shame needs to be brought to bear on the willfully naive. And a big part of the problem is the connivance of mainstream churches, Anglican, Catholic and nonconformist. And I think to some extent, liberal mosques as well in hosting hustings. And this went, this goes right back to when former ambassador to Uzbekistan, Craig Murray, stood in Blackburn against Jack Straw when Straw was foreign secretary. Uh, there's video footage of a verger chucking Craig Murray out of Blackburn Cathedral because this hustings is only for the mainstream candidates in this uh, constituency, don't you know? So the church is actively taking a position at establishment level in propping up the mainstream parties. Uh, we can't allow that. The, the C of E in particular, with its established role in England, um, has, has either got to stay out of the political process or uh, be involved in it at a level above party politics. But what we see, and we'll get back to this in a moment with uh, a bishop as well, is that the C of E has decided its only future in the day of demographic decline is to is to go in. Uh, you know, entirely hand in glove with uh, with the secular establishment. And I think that's why Farron is a bit immune to this criticism, is that the kind of churches that he and other Christian politicians go to are living in this bubble of virtue signaling. And that's where we need to tackle, I think, the problem. Talk about these things when it's uncomfortable, impolite and un-British to do so, such as on Sunday mornings. Yeah. OK, well, um, just uh, to end the election section here, we covered this yesterday, the re uh, report on gov.uk uh, discussing personal safety for people uh, campaigning during the election. Um, personal safety is one of the reasons that some people, I suspect, um, have decided not to stand. But I suppose uh, <laughs> this has got to be one of the lamest excuses we've seen uh, so far. Somerset uh, Yeovil M MP not standing because she's selling her house. It's, it's again, almost biblical, isn't it? Do you remember the, the, the parable of um, the lame excuses for people not attending the wedding banquet, uh, such as I've just bought a, a pair of oxen and I need to go and test them out. And uh, this is a Lib Dem candidate who said, I have just bought a house. I pray thee excuse me from the election. Well, she was the candidate for about a week 
uh, and the, the, the timing uh, of this was, was quite interesting, really, that uh, it's a safe seat for the Lib Dems, who are otherwise going to slump in this election if they're not careful. It was formerly Paddy Ashdown's seat. And it looks like the Lib Dems have, have lately caught up or been told to catch up with the newly centralised way in which Labour and the Tories appoint their candidates. If you look at, in local news across the country, there's very disgruntled associations. Uh, because the local associations, uh, partly because I think of Brian Gerrish's policy and others like him of uh, uh, of asking the, the, the constituencies of associations, are you aware what quality of people you're putting up for parliament in safe seats? You're responsible for what they then do as MPs. Uh, the parties have realised they can't take that risk anymore. So even the Lib Dems as the junior partners or the, 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 the third party are being told, I think from above and outside the party, you must centralise your appointments and not allow loose cannons in. Yeah. Um, okay, a couple of quick uh, ads here. Um, Nottingham wake up meeting, pro sorry, wake up project meeting uh, this Saturday the 13th starts at 11.30 a.m. Number of speakers there. Tom Crawford is organising this. Uh, get along to it if you can. Uh, you need to freeze this, uh, this uh, shot just to get the details if you want to go to that. That's in Nottingham on Saturday. Uh, and also in Saturday, uh, this time uh, in Dundee, uh, Dr. Saleya Asan. Of course, one of the two doctors involved in the Saving Serious Children documentary that Panorama put out. Uh, many, many questions to be asked uh, over that documentary and the legitimacy of the information in that documentary. So uh, Saturday the 13th, Dr. Asan is at Dundee University. Uh, get tickets for that and go and ask the questions. Uh, and if you uh, need some help to formulate questions, watch the episode of Inside Fox that uh, with with Robert Stewart that we covered this or go and have a look at Robert Stewart's uh, website. If you type in uh, Robert Stewart saving serious children into your search engine of choice, um, you'll get to his website, look at the information on that and uh, perhaps take this lady some questions. Um, okay, um, Alex, uh, Parliament here. Um, this was the uh, European arrest warrant debate in Westminster Hall. It's going back a couple of weeks now. Uh, we intended to cover this last week, but we didn't have time. So let's do it this week. Uh, European arrest warrant uh, debate. Um, what was happening here? This was a an MP. I don't know if you have the uh, the show notes to hand to, to 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 find out who it was. Otherwise, I'll look it up for you. Uh, but it was a Tory MP who's actually uh, anti EU uh, or sceptical about the EU and uh, who wanted a Westminster Hall debate, which is the kind of um, chamber uh, for deliberations outside the Commons where, where issues are, are brought to attention before voting in the chamber. And he was pointing out that, uh, as many MPs know, um, you can be whisked off to a country with a lower standard of judicial proof like uh, Greece uh, and or even Belgium and held in administrative dissension, detention for months and years, even if you're a British passport holder. Uh, under the European arrest warrant. This is the corpus juris, which uh, the EU started coming out with overtly in the late 90s. And a couple of um, uh, lawyers like uh, Torquil Eriksson, I think his name was, were, were, um, uh, regard, were, were warning about it at the time and nobody listened. Uh, and so he's standing up there. But Westminster Hall is a chamber of record like all the other parts of Parliament. Uh, and I looked uh, up in Hansard what he was going to say, having been tipped off by an, you know, one of these parliamentary watch websites about what was, what was on. And I found that Hansard hadn't uh, transcribed it. And to the best of my knowledge, it's still blank. Uh, Parliament's, yeah, there it is. Uh, Parliament's now gone into recess, recess of course, for the, uh, or, or actually been uh, prorogued for the election. Uh, and the, unusually, the clerks have not written it up. I don't know what's happened there. Um, what's, the, what's the legal standing on, on this? Does Hansard not, Hansard not have a legal responsibility to cover everything? They do. I think the clerks have got a, a very clear duty at law. I don't know whether someone's got at them or, uh, or whether it's an oversight or what. OK, well, but, that... uh, it's, it's certainly not. not no, it's, it's by order of Parliament or by order of Crown in Parliament that there's a record in Hansard. Yeah. Yes. OK. Um, well, look, let's uh, move on to France then. Uh, and of course, we've had an election in France. We haven't covered it on this news. So, so let's have a quick discussion about it now. Uh, the Rothschild man has been elected. Um, and uh, what is Les Echo saying? He's going to uh, he's going to rule by ordinance. Yes, this is the uh, Article forty nine point three of the French Constitution. Um, this is the fifth republic that France is now in because it keeps having revolutions and falling over, uh, or getting occupied. And uh, so the fifth republic's been in force since nineteen fifty eight, and the Assemblée Nationale, French Parliament, has a particularly notoriously weak role because legislators. Uh, in this model are really there just to work with the government on what the executive has already decided. 
So as in any continental country or even the US, the executive is not in parliament. Uh, ministers put legislation to MPs, legislators who've not actually uh, drafted it themselves, which is the, the first uh, breach of, of the people ruling themselves, really. And uh, in the French model, if the executive, i.e. the president in this case, uh, Macron's a, a Rothschild man, of course, so he'll, he'll uh, implement Rothschild policies all over the shop. Um, if, if the legislators reject the proposal, the draft which has come, um, and there is deadlock, after a while, the executive or the president personally can invoke Article 49.3 to hammer it through uh, on, the, on the grounds that the state is ungovernable if the executive can't get his every wish. And he's already said that he's going to rewrite France's employment law and the possibly health system. Uh, based on this policy. So he's actually said, vote for me the great liberal candidate, I will rule by decree. And people have fallen for that, largely because he's young, handsome, uh, waves his arms about and shouts, I love you, to the electorate. I'm sorry to say that the electorate is, is responsible for voting uh, such a cruddy character in, really. Um, he's also broken with previous French presidents by, obviously, he had some years in business where he was hopelessly out of his debt. If you watch Stéphane Molyneux, he details that. But uh, he picked up uh, OK English, which is a first for a French president. And there are videos of him before the election speaking, for example, over President Trump's heads to US scientists saying, I invite you to come to France uh, and be climate change scientists. So he's going to have a role. He's so photogenic uh, that he's actually going to be used to speak to the English speaking world and say, why don't you leave your rebellion against globalism and join the good side? So he's going to be able to get away with a lot of fascism and rule by decree under cover of being the, the, the great new hope for liberalism. Um, and, uh, you know, on a more general point, what is the status of the, the French constitution at the moment? Because as I understand it, they're still operating under emergency powers. They keep rolling it over. There's less and less detail in the press. But to the last of uh, my recollections, it was there was a six month rollover less than six months ago. So I think you're right. So certainly... Um, the effects are still there because uh, I haven't. I keep out of France now, although it's just down down the road in a sense by direct train from here. But uh, if you step out and and you're seen filming, even on a camera, uh, the police will come over to you and say, "Monsieur, stop filming. State of emergency, don't you know?" You know so that is going on. And by the way, I've, I've called up which uh, MP it was. If he gets re-elected, you may wish to congratulate him for raising this in uh, uh, the House. Although, sorry, in Westminster Hall, although Hansard didn't write it up, it's David. T.C. Davis, I.E.S. Davis, and he's the or was the MP for Monmouth. So there are some who are concerned about the E.A.W., which, again, is the French model coming into to British politics and British justice. Um, absolutely. Um, so, look, we'll we'll end on this one, Alex. Uh, this is The Washington Post. The headline is uh, German Army, Army officer disguised himself as a refugee to carry out a terrorist attack. Investigators say um, this is is this. Gladio at work here? But yes, it, it's the overlapping of Gladio, which is the, the Western world's uh, Anglo-Saxon-led um, counter-terrorism or fake terrorism strategy with the particular German situation where the, uh, the Galen organization, G-E-H-L-E-N, um, uh, was basically used. These were Nazis. They were used to, hop up, uh, to mop up the communists in Germany after the war, and then they formed the backbone of the post-war German intelligence services. And what sets them apart from other intelligence services in, in, should we say, moderately advanced countries is that they will actually go with big bribes um, to terrorist organizations and say, I'm putting 10,000 on the table. You can buy some guns with it if you like. And this establishes my credence with you. And that, that's how they get infiltrating into these uh, extreme left and right wing groups. And of course, what this does is fuels more terrorism. And here we have an extreme uh, case of that, I think, where um, I will call his name up while we're talking but uh, I'll young... just, let me just let me just read the quote it says that uh, yeah. Nadia Nielsen spokesman spokeswoman of the Frankfurt prosecutor's office told reporters that the 28 year old army officer was of German origin and did not appear to have any Arabic language skills why this went unnoticed I'm unable to say she said uh, calling the case curious uh, the arrest also sheds a spotlight on the chaotic situation in autumn 2015 when German Chancellor Angela Merkel temporarily opened the door for refugees, which critics say in many cases led to insufficient vetting of new arrivals. Yes, and ironically, Mike, uh, thanks for reading that out. I was going to the article to find the uh, name of the uh, army officer who, who posed as a, as a Muslim terrorist while speaking no Arabic, interestingly. And of course, the Washington Post article has even covered up uh, how continental justice works in its reporting of it. But of course, because of course, if you're charged, particularly if you're a state functionary, 
if you're charged with a crime, it's all secret, kept from the public, so nobody can know, what, know about wrongdoing by their overlords. And uh, instead of saying the prosecutor declined to name or whatever, this time they've said the 28-year-old the army officer whose name wasn't revealed in accordance with local customs. So they're even putting a kind of common law spin on it, that the Germans have a custom of not naming those accused of wrongdoing, a custom which uh, Napoleon brought in, actually, nothing to do with uh, with Germans. But here you are, there. You've, you've got these guys who are apparently lone wolves, but as Patrick Hennington says, they are actually known wolves, they're put up to it. Um, they go and do these crazy things. The state can distance itself, plausible deniability. And what they've done, meanwhile, of course, is uh, put the cat among the pigeons in, in Christian Muslim relations. And that is the intention, I suppose. Oh, it is. Uh, France and Germany now uh, are. Yeah, well, actually, the Turks have already said it. So I'm not I'm not stoking it by saying it's after them. The, the Turks have predicted that there's going to be religious wars uh, in Europe. And they mean that particularly, I think, France and Germany, that there is enough um millions of Muslims now, and particularly there's enough mistrust, uh, which is being inflated all the time between Muslims and Christians, that it's a serious prospect. You know, people don't really think about this. Again, I spoke about it in my Winchester talk um, about the uh, the 30 years war in Germany, a hideous war, worse in many ways, even than the Second World War. And I say that knowing full well what happened to the Germans in the Second World War, because in the, the 30 years war, they did all that stuff to themselves in a religious war. You know, this is where we're going to end up if we carry on this way. I mean, the, the mainstream narrative is that, the, that Huntington's Clash of Civilizations is, a, is an, an outdated uh, uh, concept, but it doesn't seem to be. No, and, and the thing is that the stable of neocon historians, like uh, you've mentioned Bernard Lewis, Mike, on occasion, who's the uh, um, the Jewish neocon historian of the Arabs, that they, they, they know a lot of stuff. And there's enough of these historians who have paid, paid comfortable lives by the, the deep state and in Britain and America to f cover the full spectrum. So there's some who pretend uh, that the neoconism is all about peace between civilizations and others say history's come to an end like Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama and others like um, Samuel Huntington are employed to say we need a clash of civilizations. So the whole uh, spectrum of opinions is being breached by men who are uh, funded by the same third world war type people. Yeah. OK, Alex, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure as always. Um, and thanks to everybody that's uh, joined us to watch. Now, uh, just a quick reminder, there are still some day tickets available for AV8, uh, which is uh, over the weekend of the 20th, 21st of May. Uh, get on to alternativeview.co.uk if you'd like to get uh, day tickets for that. Um, we'll be back uh, tomorrow at the usual time, 1 p.m. Uh, and uh, David Scott will be with us. Uh, and we'll be discussing, among other things, a very interesting new development on the Doherty case. Uh, so join us for that one o'clock tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye.